We're coming to God's Word now from John chapter 9. I hope you can have your Bibles open. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word of Truth, for your revelation of yourself most, most perfectly in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Bring that home to us now. Reveal yourself afresh. Give us eyes to see that we might trust and worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If it's too dark to see, isn't it amazing how other parts of our body enable us to find things? Like our shin finds furniture which is just a few centimetres out from its customary position. Or my classic is the uh, overhead cupboard being left open in our ensuite and I you know, do what I have to do in the middle of the night and then go bang and yeah, my forehead finds the overhead cupboard that's been left open. Blindness brings trouble and John chapter 9 may seem to be about physical blindness but really it focuses on spiritual blindness. And the Pharisees, as we read here, are upset by the man born blind who Jesus heals. And they keep poking him. Are you sure you were really, truly, really, really, really blind? And they keep asking the same question, don't they? Um, And they call in his parents to question him, to question them. Yes, he was born blind, ask him, because they don't want to cause trouble. And that And ultimately, the hostility of the Pharisees to Jesus surfaces, and at the end, Jesus just puts it bluntly, you're you're spiritually blind. Healing the man born blind signifies Jesus' ability to fix our spiritual blindness, which leads to the obvious question, what do I mean, what is spiritual blindness? At one level, without even being spiritual, we acknowledge that there's such a thing as sight that isn't literal sight. For instance, the mainstream media in our Western society can't see its own hypocrisy. Always taking pot shots, for instance, at US gun laws and yet glorifying guns and violence in blockbuster movies and popular TV shows which they promote all the time. Um, So we can talk about sight as being literally seeing things, but commonly we also talk about sight as perception of reality. And that's important to understand. What is spiritual blindness and spiritual sight in the Bible? And this gets to the subject of eternal life. Jesus says, I can give you eternal life. And behind that lies the reality that we're spiritually dead. We're physically alive and we physically see, but we're spiritually dead until he gives us his life by his spirit and we're spiritually blind until he gives us eyes to see spiritually. And to have his life means to be able to sense the environment. Any life form can sense some of the environment. Plants sense the environment. They sense light and dark, heat and cold, but can't see things coming. By the way, If you approach your plants with secateurs and they shy away from you, well, you know those plants are not of this world. You should sell them actually to Hollywood for another blockbuster movie because they can make Day of the Triffids without CGI then. Um, But on Earth, plants only sense some of their environment to some degree. Animals can sense more And human beings can sense even more. Now, I think most of us would believe that we have more than just the five human senses. For example, do you think there's such a thing as justice and injustice? As tragedy, as right and wrong, 
Do you believe those are real things? Well, we, we would do that because we're created with, a, with an ethical sense. Although that has been watered down nowadays and people just talk about morality. Uh, but I won't go into that now. Animals don't sense the difference between justice and injustice. They operate on instinct. But it's more than plants. Higher forms of life can sense more of their environment, see more of reality. So what does it mean that you're spiritually blind unless the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual sight? Until he opens your eyes spiritually, you can't see a certain amount of what's out there. And the two most important things you can't see are the weighty reality of your sin and the overwhelming beauty of God's grace. Now the Pharisees are an example of this sort of blindness. They summon the man who was born blind, then summon his parents who assure them he really was blind, which provokes them to call in the man again. And in verse 24, interrogate him about Jesus. And they say, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And the man replies, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They ask him again, how did he open your eyes? Verse 27, he replies, I've told you already and you would not listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now, he's got a lot of gumption, this bloke. Uh, they hurl insults at him. And they are the power elite in this culture, in this time and place, in this city. And he's facing up to them pretty strongly here. You are this man's disciple, maybe. We're disciples of Moses. We have the lineage. We have the heritage. We have the integrity. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And the man answers with cutting logic. And you can read it in the next verses, 30 and onwards. Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And he doesn't mean literally nothing. He means nothing like this. So he says, the really amazing thing, you Pharisees, you religious elite, is your unbelief in the face of the evidence. That's the amazing thing. That's more of a miracle than my cure, if you're being honest about it. And he points out that restoration of sight to one born blind, it, it's just never been recorded. It hasn't happened. So, surely Jesus is from God. It's God's miracle. They all know God doesn't listen to sinners. And so this irks them. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And it's a classic ad hominem argument. They, they attack the man, not, not the actual point he's making. Don't we see this all the time in our society? You attack the person who's making the point, even if the point is totally good, a, a responsible point to make. Anyway, they throw him out. And in verse 34, they imply the man's blindness is punishment for sin. And they give away their case right there, if you think about it, because they're admitting the point they've been poking and questioning all along. Were you really blind? They're admitting they know he was blind. They'd seen him every day going up to the temple. 
And this has just been a false flag argument that they've been running the, the entire time. They are deceivers. That's the way of the devil. They know he'd really been blind. They know he can now see. John often recounts and explores the way that Jesus divides people. People always like to, who I I wonder if they're genuine Christians, but maybe sometimes it is genuine Christians, want to say how Jesus brings peace. Oh, yeah, well, well, he does, peace with God, but he brings warfare with the world. We're in spiritual warfare. We weren't singing Martin Luther's hymn for no reason, gang. So he brings division. He really does. And here it is again. What is happening here is division happens and it draws everything to a potent conclusion. On the one hand, we see spiritual pride in the Pharisees. You're a sinner. We're not. We're disciples of Moses. You're a disciple of that bloke. (laughs) How dare you lecture us? What do you know? And it puts the spotlight on their sin and pride. When the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, it's not like you didn't know that something was wrong with you. Many people without spiritual sight raised in church will tacitly agree, oh yes, I'm flawed, I sin, I do some bad things. But it's only when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes that you realise, hey, I'm a sinner to the core of my being. I agree with the Apostle Paul, I am the chief of sinners. And if you don't get that, we need to talk afterwards because that's critical. If you're not thinking right now, hey, I'm the chief of sinners because I know my sin. I know I'm sinning against so much light every day. It is so stupid. Lord, forgive me. And I know that I'm called to look with grace upon everyone else. That is what I am called to do in the light of the glory of Christ. How can I say anything but I am the chief of sinners? And the Apostle Paul did too. You're in good company. But people will say, oh yeah, I'm flawed, I do a few bad things. But when the Spirit comes, he convicts you of sin and judgment. It becomes real to you. You begin to see the depth of your corruption in your motives. And I'm not saying you can see all your motives. We fool ourselves as to our motives all the time. We give ourselves credit for doing good things until we begin to see our motives. We always think higher of ourselves than we should. I have a couple of examples. Forgive me if you've heard me recount this before. For instance, I went on several driver training courses and instructors always begin these courses um, because they know the answer. They begin in a certain way and they know what's going to happen. They ask how we in the class rate our driving skills on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the bottom 10% and 10 being the top 10% of drivers. And went through the whole group and everyone was rating themselves 7 or higher until I was the second last one that they came to, second last in the room, and I said 5. And then my son Andrew was last and he couldn't say any more than five. He had to say five too and he admitted he was going to say seven too. (laughs) Um, But, you know, if everyone's seven or better, where are the lesser ones to balance out? Because, you know, this is a complete scale, ten percentiles. Huh? Or playing Scrabble. Let's be honest. The only way we lose is because we get rotten tiles, isn't it? (laughs) You see, the Holy Spirit enables us to see, uh, when we're unrepentant sinners, he enables us to see even the good things I do have poor motives, evil motives behind them, selfish motives. 
My motives aren't what they should be. I am prideful. I am self-righteous. I want to control other people, to feel better about myself, to try to get God whatever I conceive God to be, to try to get God to bless me, however I define blessing. And you begin to realise, I'm not in control of my life. And when you start to see that spiritually, you realise, I'm driven by fears, by lust. And that's not necessarily sexual lust. I'm needy. If this thing doesn't happen to me, then it drives me mad. I realise I'm out of control in many ways. I thought I could run my life my way, but my life is just a shell without accepting God's control. And this is called conviction of sin. And this means you may have already agreed in a way that you're a sinner in some kind of general way, but now it hits home, it becomes real to you. And along with that is the beauty of grace. Oh, you may have thought in your head, yeah, I know Jesus died on the cross, and yep, that's good news. It's good news like if you're buying, you know, your toaster breaks down and you go to the, um, to the store and you find there's a new toaster on special. Yeah, good news. That's, that's the level of good news when you're thinking like that. You may even have accepted that as history. Yeah, he really did die on a cross. You grow up in a church without spiritual sight. People do that all the time. But when sin becomes real to you, grace becomes real, brilliant and beautiful. It becomes not just an abstract factoid, something when you can say the creed and, yep. When you see it, it suddenly changes you. Almost anyone who has spiritual sight knows they're still to some degree and have been in the past deeply blind. And that's the reason why at the end Jesus says two things about spiritual blindness that are really vital to understand before going on to what to do about it. In verse 39 Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. And some Pharisees overheard him saying this and you know, he's shattering their categories here. This is more than any mind-expanding drug. And, and they say, what? Are you saying that we are blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, <laughs> we see, we know, we know, your guilt remains. You are guilty. Jesus says, I came into the world that those who see would be blind and those who are blind would see. He doesn't mean literally that uh, people who have spiritual sight will lose it. That is not what he's saying. It's like how there are brilliant people who write, write great books and we enjoy them. Maybe they lecture. They're smart in many ways. And Jesus says, the people who are most brilliant... And Paul repeats it at the beginning of his first letter to the Corinthians. It's the people who are most brilliant and most successful, who the world would think has the most advantages. When it comes to the gospel, they are at a great disadvantage. And people who are most disadvantaged by the world when it comes to the gospel actually have an advantage. Why? Well, the Bible says you're a sinner saved by grace. And spiritual sight opens your eyes to see that you're a sinner and can never save yourself. You need to be rescued by God's grace because of what he did through Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel. That is the gospel. And that means people who are saved aren't necessarily good people in the eyes of the world. But those who admit, I am not good and I need a saviour, And people who are lost, and not necessarily the bad people, but the proud people. Isn't it sadly ironic that we're in the middle of Pride Month? So the more brilliant, the more successful you are, the greater your disadvantage, because the Gospel says it doesn't matter 
how brilliant or how stupid you are in IQ, EQ or whatever other Q you want to measure. It doesn't matter how successful or what a failure you are, you're all dead in sin. Your only hope is to be saved by grace. You have nothing to recommend yourself. It's sheer grace. And this isn't nearly as difficult, humanly speaking, for a person who has failed or fallen to admit that the Pharisee, the successful person, the captain of industry, the brilliant person, the one who always has the idea that they're the smartest in the room, well, they find it so much harder to admit, I'm blind, I'm spiritually bankrupt. And why did this man, this man who'd been born blind, why did he suffer? Well, Jesus taught back in verse 3 that the works of God might be done in him. Generally speaking, I'm speaking generally, (laughs) unless trouble has come into your life, it is pretty tough, especially in a place like WA where things are pretty good, let's be honest. Generally speaking, it's tough to come to grips with the Gospel, to even give it a second look. The Gospel is such that people advantaged by the world, who have a pretty comfortable life, are at a disadvantage. And the people who are disadvantaged actually have an advantage. And the other revealing thing the Pharisees say is in verse 40. Are you saying we're blind? And Jesus replies, because you say you're not blind, yet you are. And Jesus means this. If you have trouble with your sight and you won't go to an eye doctor, that is what's going to destroy your sight. The doctor might be able to retard it, might be able to do something to fix it, um, even might be just something as simple as prescribing new lenses on glasses or something like that. But if you don't admit that you need new glasses or surgery or some sort of other treatment, then that problem with your sight will not be fixed. And Jesus points out the deepest blindness is blindness to your own blindness. When light comes, it shows who are spiritually blind and thus judges them. Judgment isn't the first purpose of the light, but it's an inevitable consequence. You know, one little candle, if it's lit, scientists have done studies to show, it is visible in pitch black darkness for 2.5 kilometres, one little candle. Now the thing is, if, if everyone's in darkness, you don't know who's blind and who isn't. But once the light gets turned on, you know who's blind and who's not. And Jesus is the light. And he brings this division very clearly. So you check out. It means I can test you right now. I can ask, you can think about it. You can say, if you say, I'm not spiritually spiritually blind. I can't look back at a time in which I was spiritually blind and now I see. I don't know what you're talking about, Ray. This is just gobbledygook. You're just piling words. Well, the only blindness without a remedy is blindness that you're blind to. It's the deepest kind of blindness. How do you deal with it? How is it healed? Check out this man who is physically blind, but now he physically sees. This is the sixth of seven signs which John records in his Gospel. And the word sign is only on the lips of the Pharisees here, which is fascinating, but still, I won't go into that one either. Think about that. What does this sign point to? Well, clearly, this cure signifies the fact that Jesus also cures spiritual blindness. I know I've been rattling on about it, but it's obvious, isn't it? So it's no surprise when Jesus finds the man in verse 35 and asks, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, get this. That is a loaded term. Mm. For Jews, it goes back to Daniel's vision of God in glory. And it's an awesome vision of God. So the man answers, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? 
Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And the man responds, Lord, I believe. And that makes sense. He sees more of who Jesus is, and he's growing in faith. And then John adds, this is the crunch, and he worshipped him. Without the word worship, we wouldn't get to the heart of the issue, the spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. Firstly, it's amazing that a Jewish man worships a man. Jews worship only the one true God, Yahweh. I doubt this man understood all that he was doing right here. Surely, surely, he doesn't have a well-developed theology so as to be thinking, I'm kneeling before the second person of the Trinity. I don't think he would have quite understood all that we have in our Apostles' Creed right there. But he knows that Jesus must be God on earth and he worships him. And this is the only place in John's Gospel where anyone worships Jesus. This is the ultimate healing of spiritual sight. Do you know why? Because worshipping the wrong thing is the ultimate cause of any blindness that we will have. Therefore, worshipping the right thing, God himself, Jesus, is the only way to cure spiritual blindness. And it will only be cured in time as you grow to be a better and better worshipper. If you say, I'm going to clean up my life, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to be more disciplined, live like Jesus, then God will bless me and take me to heaven. Many people think like that. They think church is just for goody, goody goodies. You won't be honest about yourself if you think like that. You will never be able to face up to yourself. You won't be able to see your sin. You will only get more spiritual pride like the Pharisees. And if someone criticises you, you'll go to pieces or you'll shift the blame. If you live for your moral goodness, you will be blind about yourself. You will set ever lower or shift the goalposts. (laughs) That's what we will do inevitably. If you live for your children, you'll be blind about them. Live for anything and it puts you into spiritual darkness. You can't see clearly. You can't see yourself or the world clearly. Only when you begin to worship in a way that God becomes the supreme beauty and joy in your life. So he becomes the most important thing who's much more than a thing Then his love for you is the measure of your worth. He satisfies you more than anything else. And the degree to which you worship and the depth to which you give your heart to God, to that degree, you'll find your sight becomes clearer and clearer You'll see yourself, you'll see reality. How can that happen? Really? Only when you truly see what happened on the cross. You can't just tell yourself, okay, I need to worship, I need to go to more services, sing louder. No, your heart must beat with new spiritual life. That's how. You need to be engaged in a new way. You need to see that when Jesus was on the cross, darkness came down and covered the earth for three hours. But it wasn't just physical darkness. He was losing the light of his Father's love when he was on earth. The light that he had always enjoyed. The light that he had always been part of. He had perfect spiritual sight. He could see into people's hearts. He sensed the reality of God the Father all the time. But in that darkness on the cross, he was being cut off. He was being plunged to take our darkness on himself. Why? Well, he has to be torn if we're going to be mended. He had to endure darkness. And if you see him doing that for you, and you begin to say, thank you, Lord, you begin to worship And your sight begins to clear. Let that happen. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that you are uncompromising in your truth, in your clarity, in even the way in which you separate light from darkness, truth from falsehood, from lies. Father, give us eyes to see, give us a heart after you that we might live the life that you have for us, not just now, but for eternity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.